I'm Naomi Barron, Executive Director of the Center for Teaching Research. And I am not regrettably Lindsay Murphy, but she is here and is really responsible for the, not just the, the terrific, but the important uh, program that's about to happen. Before we get started, though, I'd like to make just a couple of short announcement reminders. You have piles of things on your tables, but I'd like to highlight just a couple of them. Uh, the first is an award that some of you know about, because some of you know the person it's now named after, the Jack Child Teaching with Technology Award that we give each year. Um, a little flyer on the table. There is still time to nominate uh, one of your colleagues. You can't nominate yourself, but you could get a friend to nominate you. Uh, to look at the ways in which one creatively uses technology in teaching. And I'm also looking at the three people who are going to be speaking on our panel today and realize they're all using technology for teaching in very creative ways. So you have until April 15th to do a nomination. And then, because I know you have nothing else on your agendas for next week, we have another New Tech Conversation, uh, one that's generating a lot of interest because did you walk in past our students who are out there in the Mary Green Center, particularly first-year students, who are very different in kind from the first-year students perhaps we were when we started college, or if we've been teaching for a number of years, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. It's a very different generation. So we'll be doing the program, and you have a flyer describing that, and you're, you're invited to sign up, and yes, there will be a free lunch. <laughs> the last thing just to mention is we have now our second annual Faculty Summer Institute, where we have a series of workshops. There's a flyer on your tables. This is open for registration. There are a whole series of opportunities. Sign up for as many as you'd like. There's some descriptions of them, instructions on our website on how to sign up. And you'll be getting continual reminders about some of the programs that are available. What we found is having an opportunity where there's more than an hour and a half, rather half a day, a day, two full days, to really drill down on a topic um, when it's a little more relaxed because classes are over and, well, the summer session is just about starting out, but not everybody's teaching and teaching immediately. So we hope that that program uh, will be of interest to you. One of the things we do in universities and have for a very long time is read. One of the things we do as faculty is assigned readings to students. If you look at the charts on how prices have changed on what it takes to acquire the materials we want students to read, your breath will be taken away. After you have gasped, please have a listen to what Lindsay is going to share with us about what we know that's happening out there, both in terms of everything from pricing to what the student patterns are in terms of what they're procuring and what they're reading, what they're not. And then, most importantly, the sorts of things that a number of universities, and I'm very proud to say AU is now one of them, are doing to try to help students get really meaningful reading and work materials, and of course materials that aren't necessarily reading, in a way that takes advantage of technology, but at the same time makes for a yet better pedagogy. With that, I am delighted to introduce Lindsay Murphy, who I know a number of you already know. If you don't, you have a pleasure of now meeting. She is our coordinator of faculty technology initiatives, and one of the major initiatives she has is looking at ways in which we can use open educational resources to enhance the kind of pedagogical opportunities we have for our students. Thanks, Naomi. Um, well, as Naomi mentions, I'm Lindsay Murphy, and I am the coordinator of faculty technology initiatives. I joined CTRL last July, um, mainly to work on the Open American Project. It's the, the main thing that I work on. Um, and so I'm delighted to share our progress to date with you today and start this important conversation. Um, the project of Open American was initially conceived of as, as, says, as one of the responses to increasing textbook costs, but as you'll hear from our faculty, it's often about much more than just textbook costs. Um, so CTRL is interested in supporting teaching and learning, and 
That doesn't usually mean that we talk about prices of books. But anecdotally and through more formal measures, we found that the cost of books is a real concern for students. Um, I did a survey last semester of about 130 undergraduates in 13 different courses across campus and learned that 64% of those students indicated that they had, at one point or another, not acquired a required uh, textbook because it was too expensive. 64%. That doesn't mean that they're always doing it. It means that at one point or another, they have done it. They've done it at least once. That's um, on par with national averages. Um, and it, it's, it means something. It means that cost is, is an academic concern. If your students don't have the materials, whether they are too expensive, they feel that they're too expensive, if they don't have the materials, they have difficulty doing the assignments. Um, so Open American is one way to address those concerns. Through Open American, faculty work with CTRL. Um, we provide instructional design, technological support to help faculty transition from using commercial textbooks or other sort of more traditional means of resources for teaching and learning to using what are called OERs. OERs, or Open Educational Resources, are teaching and learning materials. They're usually released under what's called an open license. And an open license works in conjunction with copyright to allow the creator of the work to waive certain restrictions on how other people can use that work. So Creative Commons, for example, is an organization that makes available a number of open licenses. And if I create I don't know, a module and I want, every, I want people to be able to use it without having to ask me for permission, I can license it under a Creative Commons license. And I can choose whether I just want people to be able to use it. They can use it and sell it. They can use it and make changes. I can, I can indicate various levels of restrictions on that that will allow other people in other places to use my material in a variety of ways. Um, in addition to using these open educational resources, uh, the Open American projects often make use of materials that American students already have access to through the library subscriptions and collections. Currently, the main sort of activity of, C of the Open American Project to work with faculty on these redesigns are OER redesign grants. Um, they are in, I'm working with faculty in our second group of funding right now, and we have a next, our next round of funding um, applications being accepted through next week. Um, the first round of funding um, started last year. The courses that were redesigned through those grants began being offered in the summer of 2015. Since that time, we've had five courses completely redesigned. Um, 336 students have taken those courses, and those students have saved approximately $58,000 in textbook costs. Um, those figures are on one of the handouts on your table if you want to keep those in mind. So, as you'll hear from our panel today, there are various ways to approach these projects, these redesigned projects. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and introduce our panel, where we have Jesse Mueller, who's with the Department of Environmental Science. We have Sarah Francis Knight, who is with the Department of Biology. And we have Max Friedman, who's in the Department of History. And Max, will you go ahead and get us started by telling us a bit about your course project and how you, how you started? Sure. Thank you, Lindsay. Thanks for all of you for taking the time uh, to talk about an issue that is uh, not only the part of the wave of the future, but uh, increasingly the wave of the present. And um, I got interested in OER issues because of the synchronicity of two things that were happening at that time. One is that there were protests on campuses around the country, including this one, over the cost of higher education. Uh, protests to which I paid a lot of attention, especially because I was getting ready to teach a course on the history of social movements in the United States. <laughs> The second thing is that uh, I met one of CTRL's contingent uh, crack team of Swedish social democrats, who, um, uh, who uh, uh, Lucas Renier, who preceded Lindsay in her position, um, who explained to me, uh, really as a kind of, in, in, in an evangelical tone, that he was most interested in making college education more affordable to students. And while he couldn't persuade the Board of Trustees to lower the price of tuition, <laughs> he did have this idea. 
And I've been hearing from students that the cost of textbooks was appreciable as an impact on their lives, um, even though if you, you know, one, one might think if one didn't have a lot of close contact with college students that if you're paying $50,000 a year for college, what's another few hundred uh, for, that, for the books in that course, except that there are a number of courses. Those are out-of-pocket cash expenses. Uh, and um, many, uh, I had started hearing from students who said things at the end of the course like, I really enjoyed this course, I wish I could have afforded the textbook. And those comments seem to correlate with reduced performance and lower grades. So I was ready to hear what Lucas had to tell me, and um, I uh, uh, adopted a, um, a ready-made history textbook to replace one of my favorites, which cost $137 and shifted to, with the help of a CTRL grant, um, to using OpenStax's introductory history textbook for, um, uh, for US history. This is for a course taught in the general education program, which means, among other things, that most students are there under protest. They think they've had a lot of history. They're not eager to spend $140 for another US history textbook. And um, the uh, textbook also had the virtue of being customizable because uh, obviously a lot of you are already thinking, well, what about quality? The, uh, the text that I used was produced by, written by six historians at various institutions, at least one of whom I had heard of knowing his own research, and uh, with the input of more than 20 other colleagues, and they clearly put a lot of time into this, uh, funded in part by foundation grants, and developed a textbook that I found had strengths and weaknesses, rather like all of the printed ones that I've used over the years. The difference is I could go in and fix things because one of the virtues of the OER textbook is that you can alter it. And you have the right and you have the technical capacity to go in and rewrite sections, take them out, put in other ones, um, and make it more relevant to your course as opposed to, for example, uh, the um, uh, spe uh, having lengthy chapters that you're not going to cover and not ask the students to read. And they count those up and at a certain point they revolt over having bought a, a course course book for which they don't have to, uh, to use most of it. Um, the uh, other advantages included when I taught an online version of this course, I was able to make the textbook available from a single platform where all the other course materials were sort of one-stop shopping, except that it's free. For the students, they had less confusion about where to go. That was very helpful for those who had gone back to stay with their families in the summer or to work in China and Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. Um, where some of our summer students are uh, uh, return um, each year. And um, I, I guess one other uh, issue that came up first in my mind and then with every one of my colleagues in the humanities with whom I've talked about this issue was, well, what about all of those people who have written textbooks and depend on them to supplement their income? And I guess I want to say this about that. I feel for the victims of the changing labor conditions in the academy, uh, not only people with, you know, the, who've grasped the golden ring and have tenured uh, positions um, and a steady source of income, but see that being compressed and going into relative decline over the course of their careers. But increasingly for those who won't get tenured positions and who have to cobble together income from a number of sources. And um, this is one of the many problems in the academic labor market in which many of the things we used to do to supplement our incomes are disappearing. We're being forced to find new ways to do it, uh, to, to do activities that aren't always related to the educational mission uh, in order not to fall out of the middle class. And textbook writing has historically been something that especially people in the humanities can do where they don't have a lot of other options. However, that income was generated by students paying a lot of money for textbooks and most of the profits went to the textbook companies. And I've come down on that as saying I'm very feel, I feel badly for those of my colleagues who have or want to make money from textbooks. Um, but uh, relying on a captive market of people who have even less money uh, than us is not a sufficient reason to avoid this wave of the future. So um, the, uh, my experience with this has been positive. I'm very grateful to CTRL for its support in, uh, making, in, in freeing up some of my time from looking for other, other things uh, during that summer in order to make the transition uh, for the great assistance I got from Lucas and his assistant Bert, and now Lindsay has also been extraordinarily helpful. So I can only recommend that if this interests you, that you not worry about your own technical capacities. 
If you can read, you can work with OER. <laughs> so, will you tell us a bit about how you approach the project? Yeah, okay. So, um, the, I'm from the biology department, and the course in which we used um, open educational resources was a uh, Bio 100 um, general education uh, course. So this was a lecture course with an associated lab. So we had to, we kind of changed two aspects of our course. So we, um, with the help of Lucas again from CTRL, we um, just changed the uh, required text for, uh, for the lecture portion. And as Lindsay mentioned, a lot of students weren't purchasing this textbook. So, or they were sharing one between three or things like that. So um, that can be a bit frustrating to the lecturer if they're not actually able to access the material that you want them to access or read things before they attend your class. So we, um, or actually Lucas found uh, an open sex textbook for the lecture portion of the class and the really the content is was extremely similar to the the quality was high and it um, was extremely similar to the to the course text that was previously used so um, we decided to yes we would uh, start using this text for the um, lecture portion and then for the lab we, we had a slightly different situation we actually already were writing our own lab manual for this course so we would write this in Word or something, and then um, the bookstore would sell it for about $30. So we had, a, I think that the lecture test was about $100, the lab manual $30, they have a lab fee of another $100, so it kind of starts adding up in um, cost for the students. The, so the platform that we used for the lab manual, we decided that wouldn't it be so um, wonderful to have something that actually could be a little bit more interactive than a printed um, word document essentially and um, perhaps students could look at videos of how to do techniques uh, before they arrived in the lab so we used a, um, a website called Pressbooks and I suppose this was my biggest reservation about this project was that I am um, not particularly technologically savvy and I was a bit intimidated about making, building a, web, a website, I suppose. Um, so Pressbooks is the platform and you essentially just upload your material. So we'd already written our own material so we didn't have copyright problems with that. Um, and with Lucas's help and, and then more recently with Lindsay's help, we essentially um, were able to put our on, the lab manual online and, um, and then we, can, we could include links to um, technique videos uh, and things like, so th this is the, probably the best part of um, having something that is interactive and basically you can edit continuously. So any time the Nobel Prize awardee list came out, we could, inc we could add links to um, things that are happening in the news that's related to the topics that we're covering that week in lab. So, um, Obviously, we don't want people bringing their laptops into the lab necessarily, depending on what we're doing that week. Um, <coughs> I don't know. Students don't always quite understand uh, safety issues sometimes in the lab. So um, what we could do is, is available online, and then we would just require them to print out the procedures portion of the lab manual, or the whole thing if they wanted. Um, and so they would bring a, a portion of it to lab, just... Um, the sort of the methods part. Um, so we've been able to survey our students um, after the end, at the end of the semester and we received very positive feedback from the students. Mainly, I mean, I suppose they were happy with just the re reduction in cost because they haven't taken the course with the textbook and without, so they don't know what it was like before. That's kind of one issue that you, it's kind of hard to get at. But um, overall, we, we've had a really positive experience. And um, so this is our, our second semester that we've been using the um, open resources. And um, one thing we did find that I thought was quite interesting is that so the, the, t the course is taught as a hybrid over the summer. So they um, have lecture online and then they come in for the labs. And those students that are already online taking an, a, a, a portion of the course online seem to work really, really well with the online lab manual. 
So I don't know whether that's something that we could kind of capitalise on um, during the normal semester, but that's just something that we have noticed. Um, yeah, uh, the fact that we can change it as we go along has been great. It's, it's like a, a dynamic um, lab manual that we can adjust if they have snow or we can um, yeah, make, make changes to if we, if we want to. So in that way, it's been really good. So yeah, we've had a very positive experience with, um, with this project. Certainly. Great, thanks Sarah. Jesse, do you want to tell us a little bit about your course? Sure. Um, so I teach, um, well the course that I, I use the OER for was for environmental toxicology. And I've taught this course a, a number of times now, but every time I was teaching it I was coming up with a new textbook. Um, it's a graduate <laughs> level course and I only teach it every two years and so there were new developments in the field. Um, and it's also a very specific area. It's not general chemistry or something that it gets a little bit outdated more so than the basics of it. So the basic toxicology portion was something that I could use um, in OER for, and I'll talk about a little bit about how we ended up with that. But what I really struggled with was the specific topics that were more emerging and um, and finding something that captured that, a, a textbook that captured that, so I kept changing textbooks every time I would teach it and, um, and change the course accordingly then. Um, and because I was going to be changing it anyway, I applied for this grant and thought, well, I'll try this this time. Um, so mine was more of a different pull towards it. It didn't necessarily start with um, the cost of the textbook, which is definitely an added bonus, but mine more had to do with the content and what was available and what was relevant to the course. Um, so I, I had some reservations, but I've taught online and hybrid classes before, so I was comfortable with that portion of it. I thought it was going to be um, pretty easy, which was super naive, but um, I'll, I'll explain why that, it, Lindsay made it easy though, again. But I went through this like up and down of, oh, this is going to be simple because I found these sources online, they're gonna be great, and I, then I showed them to Lindsay and she was like, no, no, you can't use those because there's copyright issues with those. So um, then I had to start from scratch, but Lindsay and I worked together on that and that was wonderful because I had this long list of topics that I wanted to have covered that I had covered in, other, in the class before, um, but how do you find a textbook that actually covers that, especially something that is pretty high level and pretty specific, and it turns out there aren't that many online for a very specific high level textbook. So um, what we did find though was a, um, a general basic toxicology textbook that was available online, and um, fundamentals toxicology, and, um, and that actually provided the good basic framework for the course. So the students were able to get all of the background information that then I could build on with more specific um, topics. What this meant was that um, they had a number of different resources that they had to read every week, that they have to. I'm teaching this course right now. So that they have to read every week. And, um, and so I feel like they've had more readings than they would have if they had a one-stop shop, but I have gotten zero negative feedback about this because I think that we're approaching it from, again, two different levels. We have a very basic foundation of toxicology with this textbook, but then I'm able to add in more specifics um, with supplemental readings that are still required. They're not really supplemental, but additional readings. Um, another component that we've been able to use, two of which, um, one of them is called the um, Toxicology Tutor, and the other one is called ToxLearn. They're both um, tutorials that are available online through um, government websites, NIH and NIHS, I think. Um, and so I assign portions of these tutors to the, um, to the students when that relevant topic is, you know, when we're covering it. Um, they have these little online quizzes that they take as well. I don't, it's not something that I grade or anything, it's just a knowledge check. But that actually um, then led me to change the way that I teach the course because Previously, I had been doing in-class cooperative quizzes with the students to cover the material when they would come to class, and um, I back backstepped from that. Backstepped from that because I wanted to actually, I didn't want to be redundant, and I didn't want them to have extra work on, you know, in the class that they perhaps have already covered, you know, or at least thinking the same way about taking a quiz. So um, I love these two resources; they are excellent, and they make it a little bit more. Um, dynamic, like um, you were saying that you know having some a resource that is more dynamic than just reading is actually an added bonus. I really like that a lot. So these two resources actually allow for that. 
um, in that the students are working through something and they can go back and forth and it's more interactive. I'm not able to change it, <laughs> but it is more interactive for them. So um, I've it, the way that I've had to change the course a little bit though is when I'm teaching um, content or doing case studies in the class with them, I need to go back and do the readings myself right before the class because they're all a little bit different. When you know a textbook inside and out, you know what the <laughs> students are coming to class prepared with, but I have such a hodgepodge of readings now put together. They're all in one place and Lindsay helped to make it super streamlined and efficient and it's all in Blackboard and very nice folders, what's optional, what's required. It looks very nice, but it is still content-wise different every week for the students and for me. So I need to go back and always check um, and make sure that what I'm covering in class is building on what they're actually reading. So there's a little bit of, um, of that, but I think that these are ways that I'm going to be able to update it as I go also, because it is a class that I only offer every two years. So it's going to be, I'm going to have to change it in two years. That's one of the downsides of it, is that I am going to have to go back and check all of the content and make sure that it is relevant, mm -hmm. up to date, and, um, and something that I want to cover again. So, yeah. Thanks. Um, at this point, I think we want to turn it over to questions. And we've heard a lot about three diff pretty different projects. Um, and what do you all have to, have to ask? Do we have, we do. Nick, you'll be right over with them. <coughs> Hi, um, you, you talked about a lot about the sciences. I wonder, are there any of these materials done for more professional type courses, skills type courses, writing, editing, photography, whatever? Yes, asterisks. Um, so a lot of the OER funding has come through community colleges. So courses that are high enrollment at community colleges have lots of material. Um, courses beyond that have, in some cases, like with the toxicology, the government has a vested interest in teaching people about toxicology, so they make a lot of, of materials available. Um, there are more OERs becoming available every day, really, but um, over the past several years, we see a lot of increase because of the grant funding that's been happening. Um, so likely, yes, but we can talk more. So a lot of it's grant the materials there come from grants, which tells me something. Okay. So, yeah, the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Hewlett, and uh, Lumina have all been pretty involved in funding OER creation. The federal government now has a number of their grants tied to anything that comes out of this needs to be publicly available under an OER license. Um, and then there are also things happening at the school level, right? So people involved in this project are encouraged to then contribute back the materials created to like the lab manual you created, you released under an open license. So someone in another school can then use that lab manual. Yes? So I've been using, what, I, I don't use a textbook, and I pull together videos and readings and quizzes and that stuff. But whereas I've been putting it week by week on black, where basically what you're doing is creating an online, instead of having to put it on each week, it can be a centralized? It depends. <laughs> That's the answer to a lot of things today. It depends. So, um, it depends basically on the, on the copyright restrictions of whatever material you're using. If you're using things that are available through the library databases, that someone needs to have access to the university or access to a subscription service to use, you cannot put those just on any old website because the terms of service of accessing that material say you have to have a subscription to use this or be affiliated with, with the subscription uses. So those kinds of things need to stay through Blackboard. Um, other kinds of things that are publicly available on the web, you can compile the links to them on an open basis, like on, on an open website. Um, but if there's no added value to doing that, and your students are already using Blackboard, then keeping it in Blackboard is, is sufficient. I think that's what we ended up deciding. Go see. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that sort of decision. Well, so I, I mean, I can talk a little bit about the week-to-week -week part, at least, because that's the way that I had previously set up. I, I had folders by topic, not necessarily week by week, but week by topic by topic. and. Um, and after talking to Lindsay and to Rachel in the library as well, Rachel Borchardt, um, 
who helped a lot with copyright issues too. So um, we decided to have it actually all in one, um, all in Blackboard in individual folders that were by topic, but have it all posted ahead of time so that they could have access to it for the full semester. Um, one of the things that I struggle with for a um, for a higher level uh, course, I you know a lot of students like to, especially graduate students, like to keep their textbooks um, because they spent the money on them. But if they're not spending the money on them, maybe they wouldn't want to keep it. I don't really know. But um, but they do sometimes refer to them, and so by posting everything on Blackboard, that does that does not allow them to then go back and check them out later if they're, you know, down the road. So that's one thing that I'm not, you know, I, we, Lindsay and I have had this conversation before because that's, I mean, it, it might be an issue for some students that actually want to pursue environmental toxicology and might want to look back at the resources and wouldn't necessarily have those available. But is it getting to your, your question though, I did end up posting them all on Blackboard and all in um, folders. Some of them were open access, like just websites, and some like the, the tutors and things, and some of them were um, it, you know, textbook that we actually needed to access through the library to have access to. Um, I have two questions. First of all, I guess, Jesse, I teach a class and it's on the media, so it's constantly changing. So do you do all the updating? That sort of you do. Yes. <laughs> Um, that, that to me is, uh, I mean, the textbook I use right now, it comes all updated. And, and the idea that I every year have to go in and like figure out what media company bought another media company is sort of a headache. So. Yeah. But you do it all, all the updates. I do it all. Um, mine is probably not changing quite as much as yours. So, um, But it does change. And I, there are topics, I mean, especially pollution issues, um, I need to keep updating those. And, but I do that for my other courses as well, uh, to even just with, you know, articles, uh, website articles and things like that. So that I'm pretty, yeah. uh, you know, something I try to stay on top of, but I know that I'm missing things because of that, yeah. And then for all of you, do you ever get any pushback from the students that they have to read everything online? Because I do get some of that, that they complain that, oh, I'm so tired of reading on the computer all the time. So they don't have to. One is that they can pay to have a printed version provided to them at a fraction of the cost of a typical textbook. Another is they can print it out themselves, and which is not cost-free and cumbersome, but those are the two options that are still in their minds better than what they, the, alter, the older alternative would have been as far as that goes, and I had only a couple of students do that. Do they all print out the biology? So um, the biology textbook that we use is available online, but you can also buy this copy for $29. So it's still a lot cheaper. Or you can print out chapters that you want and pay print uh, page costs. And so for the whole lab manual, if you printed the whole one, I think it costs them $6 if they wanted to. And they, they do. They do often print it out. I mean, it's personal preference, I suppose. But yeah, it's easily available printed. Show us uh, any nifty tools about how to find OERs that are available. Like that. Sure. Um, so this website right here, well, this this picture right here is actually the top of our open site, and it's a slowly growing collection of resources for OERs. Um, right now, I have about fifty, I believe. 50 different sources of alternative materials. Um, and you can go to it and navigate through your school. It's, it's incomplete. It's growing and it's incomplete. But um, it is a good way to start and see what's out there. Um, and this is honestly when, right, when, when Jessie gave me the list of topics that she wanted. I said, OK, I'll, I'll do a search. I'll see what I can find. I start here. And then I, you know, how the internet works. You click on one thing, and then you click on another thing, and then you click on another thing, and then if you're lucky, you 30 minutes later find what you need. If you're unlucky, an hour later, you are looking at cat videos. Um, <laughs> but so we, I have this growing, and I'm happy if you find things, if you email them to me, I'm happy to add them. Um, it's a good place to start, and you can find it at www.edspace. Actually, it's not www. It's HTTP. Edspace.american.edu slash open. I believe it's on um, the, a flyer on your table as well. 
Um, and so that's a, that's a great first place to look. There are also, you can look for openly licensed materials through a, a modified Google search, through YouTube, you can filter your materials by openly licensed things. There's um, a giant database called Merlot, which stands for multi, Multimedia Educational Repository something something. Um, and it contains millions of individual things. Some of them are assignments that individual uh, instructors have uploaded and said this works great. Some are whole textbooks, like you'll, you'll find a number of the uh, OpenStax materials in there. Some are slides, some are so all sorts of things. It's like when you go to the copy room and you find someone's assignments on the copier. <laughs> it's like that digital times a million. Um, so yes, there are, there are a lot of ways to find things. And I'm also happy to help you look as you're getting started. <laughs> oh, and I want to take a moment, I believe we're going to be losing Max in a few minutes, um, to a meeting. So if you have, if anyone has any questions specifically from Max, please ask those now before we lose him to other important matters. Do you know how many people are using that text and did you get any feedback from the publisher about the edits that you made? No, um, I don't. Uh, Lindsay, do you know? Not the specific text. Um, over like one and a half million students use all of their texts and they have, I believe, 15 textbooks available. A lot. And on feedback, what I haven't done yet uh, so the changes that I made were in order to customize it to the topics that we were covering. Um, when I do a deeper dive, which is my plan for what comes next, into um, re replacing their coverage of some of the topics with my coverage of some of the topics, because I see things differently, then there's an opportunity for me to submit that uh, to uh, the original authors who are doing updates. And so they request and welcome um, people to send in changes that they want to propose, and that's part of the, the, their process of trying to continue to keep it updated and to, uh, to continue to make quality improvements. You can see um, this, is the, for, this is the American University version of the OpenStax history book that you're using. You can see it starts at chapter 15, so if you look at the original book, it starts at chapter 1. Uh, a number of comments um, that may turn out to be queries, we'll see in no particular order. Um, you've spoken a lot about OpenStax. Just to give a little more background, this is a project that was started at Rice University not that many years ago with a lot of grant funding. And the goal was to say, how do we take the areas where we have the largest number of undergraduates, and it often will mean in community colleges, but it also often means the first two years of, of a four-year school, um, where there tend to be textbooks, which are the kinds of things that publishers are spending way too much money on producing because they think they need lots and lots of color and this and that, and the authors are not always getting nearly as much as one might hope they would uh, because the cost of producing them is expensive. So this is a, what we might call a very high quality set of now 15 books that are available, as, as our speakers have said, both digitally and in print and print at very low cost. You can buy them on, I think, Amazon. Um, the thing to know about open educational resources, as Lindsay was explaining, is there are lots of things out there, and some of them are not of such great quality. And you can spend a lot of time looking at some things that are, you'd say, you know, the title looked right, but I would never use this in a class. Which leads me to another open invitation to anyone who is here, namely to do uh, in a larger scale some of the things that Max is doing by recrafting the parts of the book that he would like to do differently, or that biology for its lab manual is doing, saying, this is what we want to do in our lab. Not what someone else says we should do, this is what we want to do. Uh, there is one project uh, in the School of Communication to do uh, a from scratch open educational resource text for a class that many people take. And I will give an open invitation to anyone who is interested in putting together his or her own materials. It's a larger project, obviously, to write a book from scratch, 
but you're not necessarily having to write everything. You can take pieces that are available from other places. You may want to say, well, this, this, this book now comes in two parts. One is the things that are really open that I could make available to other people because this really is a sharing economy in the best sense of the term. And then there are parts that the library pays a lot of money to license and that will be available only to people who are registered for my course because I can't say that somebody in another institution somewhere can get access to the journal for which we receive online grants. Uh, but this is very much a moving <coughs> initiative that we're looking to develop with, with as many people who would be interested in doing it. Just a couple of other uh, observations. Uh, very good question about do some of your students want to read in print versus read digitally. Uh, I probably know a fair amount about these issues. It's what I spend most of my time doing research and looking at. And what's really clear is if you ask students where they concentrate best, they will tell you they concentrate best reading print. What we have to figure out is because so many things are digital, how we help students concentrate reading digitally. And that's, that's a challenge to us rather than just an assumption we can make that students can do it. We know digital is not going away. We know particularly for textbooks, there's some incredibly good things that you can make changes in the text and so forth that can be interactive. Uh, you can have adaptive learning and on and on and on. But that's one of the challenges we need to think about as we might increasingly, for the good reasons, move to uh, open educational resources in the digital format to think about what it means to get our students to focus, to concentrate, to read, to reread uh, those kinds of materials. Other ideas or questions? So um, I'll mention I'll mention another project. Naomi mentioned um, a uh, project in the school of communication. Um, we have. One of, one of our chemistry professors here today. I'm working right now with two chemistry professors, Michelle and um, Sarah and Hal Floyd. Don't do this. Um, and both, if I can control the spot a little bit, both, both um, faculty came and said, well, Michelle, you said that your textbook was expensive and it's for a gen ed course and it's for non majors and it just didn't make sense. Similar to how um, Sarah, you and the biology team approached this. Um, and so we're, we're using OpenStax, and Michelle's going to add things and change things. That's, 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 what's, that's what the project is. Um, and so like Naomi said, you can make the text your own without having to write it entirely yourself. Um, the other chemistry project is quite different. It's using the same base text, right? It's using an OpenStax 100 level-ish chemistry book and turning it into a textbook for chemistry of cooking for which at the time that we started talking about the project, there was no suitable textbook for. Um, so those are two sort of divergent ways to take a textbook, an open textbook, and really turn it into something that works for your class and works for the kinds of things that you need to know, you need your students to know about, and helps you get rid of the things that you don't need to cover in your class, um, and really build sort of a customizable and um, that's the word I'm looking for, engaging material. You're adding a few looking at videos to add. Um, there's all sorts of things that you can change. I don't know if you have anything that you want to add, Michelle. Probably like the recent articles explaining like what's new in chemistry, something that they could relate to. Yeah, so that was recent articles, things that are new in chemistry, things that they can really relate to, sort of how this plays out right now in the real world. Um, that's great. I'm just curious, Max, you referred to some of your own personal uh, um, impetus in terms of um, why you were sympathetic to having open educational resources. But, I mean, we have a sense of what the awareness uh, among students right now is in general, and whether or not this is something that we're just ahead of the curve on in terms of the demands that they will, they will be making more specifically. So I had never had a student say, couldn't you use an open educational resources <laughs> textbook, such as the one developed under the Rice University's grants and so forth. <laughs> I did have students complaining uh, about not being able to afford the, the textbooks in their courses and making choices not to buy all of the books, even when they knew that their grades would suffer, and more important from my perspective, that their learning would suffer. 
So I've heard plenty of that, and I think students are, are instantly aware uh, of that problem. I have to say, the first time I did it, I, I first was online, and then the second time I did it in a face-to-face -face class, I made a lot, of, a big deal of this. You know, I wrote in the syllabus about what OER is. You know, I, I presented it to them when I was going through the syllabus, and I paused and I said, you're welcome, and I thought there would be applause. <laughs> and they looked at me, you know, like, whatever. <laughs> because because they, that's the way this class works, and another class works differently, and so forth. Um, so I, I think this is a case where the movement came from below, and we became aware of it, and then tried to think of what we could do to try to address it. But that's you know just my experience of it. It may be that someone out there knows more about uh, student demand and student awareness. Um, before you went to the OAR book, did you try using an ebook, you know, from the library for your previous textbook? Was that an option, sort of as a transition? Because that's kind of where I am with with things, but with mixed results. Wondering if you had that experience. I haven't had that experience. I have. I've been using electronic textbooks for my classes for the past couple years, and um, and I I like them. Some students they they have the option of still buying the hard copy textbook if they want to, or I always make sure that they're on reserve in the library. So if they want a hard copy, they can go hold the hard copy in the library or check it out. And make sure there's a couple copies available, and I usually have them in my office too for those students that really. You know, they, they really need that hard copy, but they maybe can't afford it. Right. No, that's what I've been doing, and I'm pleased with that option, but it doesn't help you, you know, customize the way these resources do right. and keep up with the current... I teach public health. It changes very much like your field, mm -hmm. and so that's really appealing. Um, but my students have been very appreciative of the e-books when they're available. And they are cheaper, too. That was why I went to them to begin with, was the electronic textbooks, yeah. But, I mean, they tend to be cheaper than the hard copy. I will point just one sort of side note. Although they are often cheaper than the hard copy, you're usually with a digital book getting a rental access. So you're paying less than you would to buy the textbook, but you don't get to keep it. So you're paying a lot of money for usage rights for four semesters, four months. Okay, well, what I'm talking about is putting the ebook on course reserves. So that's different right. than a rental. Right. Yeah. And I just uh, pertain to the same thing for Max. Where do they buy? Where do they buy that? Or no, the biology text that you showed us. Where exactly do they buy it? Do so, they want the printed version. So um, they just go to the website where they would download the PDF, and then there's a link. And I, I bought this from Amazon. And the book you can place in your order with the bookstore if you explain this is an OER textbook. Estimates of 10% adoption rates are common. Um, and then provide uh, the, the publishing information. The bookstore can stack, uh, can stock some of them in advance. Going to the issue, <clears throat> going to the issue of what our students' level of awareness is. Uh, perhaps one has to look at the broader issues of how students have been procuring books for some time. Once, uh, whether it was Amazon or other kinds of textbook suppliers online, came available. Once rental of textbooks, whether of print or digital, became available, what you found is a level of insider knowledge that our students have that would blow our minds as to how to get the least expensive option for this or that. So students have been very aware of prices of textbooks even before we have. It's now been, Marilyn Goldhammer is sitting there. She's been sending out a letter um, which I hope everybody here who teaches has gotten a copy of, trying to make, uh, now for about two years, trying to make faculty aware there are actual dollar signs attached to the materials we're asking students to procure. So my sense of things is, by using open educational resources, we are, feed and maybe this is, Max, why people didn't cheer us. They should have, uh, but didn't. Uh, because they're saying, aha, you're offering me the kind of thing I've been looking for anyway to reduce the cost of the book. Good. Yeah. Thank you. If I could take a parting shot on rental textbooks, just to be aware. Um, I don't know how common this is, but you sometimes come across rental textbooks that differ from the printed textbook, for example, that don't, weren't able to get the same kinds of copyright for the rental version as they had for the print version, and therefore leave some things out. And after a Learning that from perplexed looking students who thought that they had the same readings, um, I've now put a warning note in the, in the syllabi uh, about that problem. So something else to bear in mind, which you could get around with OER. And just one other thing to add, 
Uh, it has become ubiquitous in many other countries, but including the United States, for students to purchase illegal copies that are available from other countries in distant lands. And one of the reasons students do it is because the official version is three or four times the price. So one of the other advantages of making textbooks affordable in the United States is to help make our students learn ethical. We'll take just a moment. Thank you, Max, so much for it. Sure, thank you very much. Just to add one, one thing to what Naomi and Lindsay said, we did a series of focus groups last year with students asking them about textbook prices. And one thing to remember is that it's never just any one of our individual courses. So maybe the books for your course are only 50 or $75, but when you put five courses together, and one of those, the text for the Ed Psych course I teach, which I don't expect students to buy, I put multiple, multiple copies on reserve, is $238, and that's just really prohibitive. But it's $238 plus $150 plus $100 plus $40, and students shocked us with their bottom line. Anything above $25 or $40, they thought long and hard before they purchased it. So there's a cumulative effect, which is why this becomes such a big issue. Even if your courses are quote-unquote reasonable, if the next three courses are not, students will resent the amount you're paying for an individual course. So it's just something to bear in mind. Other thoughts, questions, ideas? <coughs> yeah. This is a question for Naomi. Okay. I was just wondering, because I've been trying to use e-books and electronic copies of things and used copies and only for that version, but how with e-books and digital reading, mm -hmm. do you get students to focus on the text the way they do with the I can't even bring it up and, you know, analyzing certain passwords in the poem. But sometimes we'll say, well, remember when this happened? Or remember when the author said this? And they either have read it once quickly and they don't have any page knowledge and they aren't necessarily hearing the memory of that. So do you have any suggestions? Uh, I have some research to cite to support what you're saying. Okay. Uh, there's a woman by the name of Ann Mangan who's done some very interesting research uh, showing if you read a story on a digital on a digital platform as opposed to reading it in print, you're more likely to remember the order of events of the plot if you read it in print. And part of the problem is we haven't taken the change of medium as something we have to come to grips with. The analogy I like to make is what happened when we first started doing word processing. Some of us remember, this is now back in the mid to late 1980s, when suddenly you could produce text on, I mean it was on mini computers or dumb terminals at that point, and there was WordPerfect that in principle let you move clumps of text, and students didn't know how to do it, and we didn't know how to advise them. We said, oh, there are these editing possibilities, go use them. And gradually, as you moved into the 1990s, we taught people how to write using digital technology. It wasn't something that was evident. And what I think we need to figure out, I don't have the answers, but I have questions, is how we're going to, using <coughs> digital technologies, get people to have that same level of focus that at least in principle, not always in practice, in principle, print encourages. So in the research I've done, I have students who say it takes me longer to read print than it does digital. Well, sure it does, because we are used to reading digital faster. We're used to searching for things rather than reading continuous texts. Um, one of the things we can do is say, print out such and such, annotate such and such. We know there's far less annotation that's going on when you're reading digitally than when you're reading in print, even though there are annotation tools available that are typically more cumbersome than using a pen. We know all kinds of things about connections between writing by hand, annotating, and learning. So this is an area where we have to figure out what to do. And nobody has figured this out, to my knowledge. Uh, but for our own courses, we get to set our own rules. So I have colleagues, for example, who teach in computer science, not at this university, but elsewhere, who say, I make my students print out the readings 
annotate them by hand, and turn them in. Digital readings. But this is the way that I get them to focus. There are lots of data suggesting that students who tend to be more serious, it also tends to be females more than males, uh, <coughs> tend to print out things they get digitally so that they can read it again, so that they can, so that they can stumble upon it again, uh, annotate it, and so forth. Because I don't want to just print out everything, but I do want to follow the logical structure and analyze right. in some cases. So that's what I say. So probably I'm trying to print it out and annotate it. And probably mixing media to say you can read this digitally, and I want you to write through, and I want you know to write down and print out how you analyze this text, and give me the page numbers, and with the e-text that's sort of hard to do. So cite the text, figure out some way to mix the media, and that seems to be working um, for some experiments that are done in middle schools now. But we need to figure out the problem. Thank you. Can I add a little bit to that too? Um, and some of the e-textbooks that I've used that have accompanying software, which usually have added costs too, but sometimes you can get a package. If they do um, have the accompanying software, that you there there are some components that have an interactive part, and that I feel like the students, if they if I require them to do these things as they're reading, I feel like they retain that knowledge a lot better than if they just had the e-textbook. So I started out with just using e-textbooks, and this isn't for the toxicology course, this is for uh, mostly gen ed courses, the environmental science 100, 200 level. And, um, and those, I, they, they do tend to, um, to retain it a little bit better if, they, if there's that component. But again, you have to look at the cost of everything. Sometimes the, the, that software package can be cost prohibitive. But sometimes, it's a, for some of my textbooks, it's actually cheaper than buying the e-text by itself, which is a strange thing, but <laughs> it's the truth, so. Okay, so that's all um, I wanted to ask both of you to share a little bit more about the feedback you've gotten from students. Sarah, you mentioned that we, got, we did a survey last semester, I guess. Um, and I know, Jesse, you did a mid-semester survey just a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could share some of the thoughts that your students, students have broadly. Uh, my, um, my students really like the, um, the online tutors, those, um, those interactive learning tools that are available um, from NIH and NIHS. So those were, um, they really like those too. And so, you know, I, like Lindsay and I were just talking about this before class because some of them I, I'm worried that they're not going to be available in two years <laughs> because I'm not teaching again for two years. I'm like, ah, what if these aren't available? These are the best parts. But um, she, you know, Lindsay said that these I could potentially download these and maybe CTRL could help with that so that they were available uh, when I need them. But I think that's I got good feedback on that in my midterm survey. Um, they they really did like these, and the, I, they didn't say anything about the readings, so <laughs> but they like these. So I, I suppose just the results that I remember from the survey um, were, I suppose, primarily about um, cost, really. They were, they were um, happy paying less because, like I mentioned, they have to already pay a lab fee. So, um, and I feel like the students may not have been um, referring back to that textbook in the future if it was a, a, a general education class. Um, one thing, I suppose, that we have realized as time has gone on, we've actually been able to use this, um, our resources for um, training our TAs as well. So we are able to add material which is uh, um, accessible for students, but also we have undergraduate um, TAs in some of our labs and graduate student TAs. So um, in terms of feedback, we've not really had any negative feedback, so I guess that's something to do. And, um, I think more students. I mean, more students have access to the text now than because it's available freely. Um, so that's. Oh, I was just wondering if you have looked at all at course performance, because it, just to try to get an idea of whether with this online textbook are more people reading it than before, or. If they, you know, maybe they're turned off to, so they're not retaining it. So it would be really interesting, and I guess also in a class like uh, by 100, where you have a big sample size, to see if there's any differences in in 
course performance. Have you guys thought about looking at yeah, that? Yeah, we certainly wanted to, just to reassure ourselves that the the, the new text was um, equivalent to the to the old text and that the, the students were, were grasping just the, the same, con um, I guess, content. And so uh, we are working on analyzing, um, I guess, student learning. And um, one thing we are still struggling with getting students to do the reading, whether it's online or print. I mean, we're still that's still something that we're trying to tackle. Um, so we're kind of still kind of trying to brainstorm ways that we can use the online manual um, and the text to try to encourage the students to read. Um, so we we have a, a few different things we're trying to guess, manipulate quizzing them when uh, when they arrive in the in the lab which we were doing previously on the content of you know the reading what they were doing in the lab that that week now we've started um, actually making them read um, articles current scientific articles related to that topic that we're covering this week and then kind of trying to have a discussion about those in the lab or a quiz about those in the lab um, but yeah we sh we certainly are trying to collect data on how successful this project's been because it's a huge number of students every semester and as I mentioned before I feel like it's almost a bit more successful in the summer with the hybrid class students so. um, Have you guys thought about using this at all this for course promotion maybe linking it to your uh, information about your class I mean as a, as a student I, I want to know if, obviously what's gonna, what am I going to read and um, is it free that's a great thing and if when I'm reading the blurb, it might be a way to promote courses as well for students who are, you know, outside of you interested or being students. Um, how did you all let your students know that there was no textbook? Or did you? So I believe that um, we did. I think that um, we we're, we were anxious that they, the students before arriving would rush out and buy the text without that not knowing that it was available free. Because um, maybe you know they could just never have to pay anything for it. So um, I, I believe we just published, put the, the syllabus, put it on the syllabus, and made the syllabus syllabus available before the beginning of the semester. I think that's what we did. Yeah, pretty much the same thing. I got a student that sent me an email asking where the textbook was, <laughs> and I wrote back and said it's actually it's going to all be online, and. Um, and then that you know referred to the syllabus for that as well. Other questions or ideas, comments? Okay, well, um, I want to thank our panel for sharing their expertise with us and talking about this new program. Um, and as Naomi says, we have some things to figure out still on how to get the students to do the reading. Um, but we are helping them have access to the reading at the very least um, and identifying alternative places that might be really engaging places for them to get the content. Um, I encourage you if you're interested in pursuing um, OER for your course on a global level or on a small level, right? Your textbook is fine except it doesn't do this very well. Is there an OER that could supplement? Get in touch with me. I'm happy to help um, help you start the process. I left my cards on the table, so please feel free to take one. Um, and I, I'm here to help, and I'd be happy to do so. Um, and with that, I will once again thank our panel, and thank you all for joining us today. Look forward to extending this conversation.